previously on Another Dead Man Walking. Yes! Richard's gonna live! This potassium chloride, it's like being burned alive. I would support hanging or beheading or whatever it would take. You're still trying to execute the innocent man. I'm Ian Woods, and in this episode of the Richard Glossop story, I'll be looking at the evidence that put him on death row. This case is unique, at least in the past decade. This relies solely upon the evidence. One man. Richard Glossop will be executed on the 16th of September. According to the governor of Oklahoma, the judicial process has run its course. He's guilty of murder, and she doesn't plan on intervening even to grant a temporary stay of execution. And you might say, why should she? He's had two trials. Two juries found him guilty. Appeal courts rejected his lawyer's complaints. The parole board turned down his appeal for clemency. But from the moment of his arrest to the day he dies, Richard Glosser will tell you he's not guilty of murdering Barry Van Treese. I'm truly sorry for what happened to Barry. I am. But I had nothing to do with it. I truly had nothing to do with it. I would not have hurt Barry in any way, shape, or form. And I surely wouldn't have had somebody else do it for me. You know, I can only hope that something happens to, to make a difference, to stop this from happening. That was part of a long interview which Richard Glossop gave to Fox 25 Oklahoma reporter Phil Cross last November. Although Richard and I have spoken many times on the phone and he is willing to be interviewed on camera, the Oklahoma authorities have stopped that from happening. I've had lots of arguments by phone and email about this and even turned up unannounced at the office of their communications director to press my case. But in her view, death row prisoners are allowed one media day if they want to give interviews. And Richard Glossop had his last November. I am allowed to visit him in prison without a camera or even a notebook and I'll tell you about that next week. But when he spoke to Fox last year, he admitted he's not entirely innocent. I made some really bad decisions after the fact. I'm not saying I didn't. Um, but I think I paid for them with 17 years of my life. Specifically, he lied to police when Barry Van Treese was first reported missing. Let's take you back to January the 7th, 1997, and tell you Richard's version of the story. Barry Van Treese owns the best budget motel in Oklahoma City. Richard is the manager. Justin Sneed, who everyone agrees carried out the murder, is an unpaid odd job man who lived at the motel. According to Richard, Sneed woke him up in the middle of the night to report a window in one of the rooms had been broken in a fight. He just stood there for a minute and then uh, he started to walk off and as he was walking off he said, uh, I just killed Barry and he just had a weird look on his face like, a, like it was a joke. And I just, you know, being that early in the morning and stuff, and I just didn't believe what he said, and I closed the door and went back in and laid back down. Barry Van Treese's body remained undiscovered in room 102 until 10 p.m. But when he was first reported missing, Richard Glossop didn't tell the police about his late-night visit from Sneed. There's a lot of reasons for that. One, I didn't believe it when it happened. When I was first told about it, I didn't believe it at all. Two, I listened to some people that I shouldn't have listened to. Um, when I had gotten called back to the motel, I got there. Uh, my desk clerk said that, you know, the motel had already been searched. So I didn't have to do that. And, but me and my girlfriend at the time, Deanna, we went to the other room and I asked her, I said, should I tell him what Justin told me? She asked me not to until I knew for sure. That's when it all went downhill after that because I got these people asking me all these things and I got people telling me you shouldn't say nothing until you know for sure. So here I am stuck in this thing now. And it's just looking bad on me because I didn't do the things I should have done immediately. He's told me that if he'd been charged with being an accessory after the fact, he would have pleaded guilty. But lying to the police is one thing. Conniving with Sneed to instigate a murder is another. Don Knight is an attorney who's now working on the Glossop case for free, trying to find new evidence to exonerate him. He says Richard lied because of the kind of customers who used the motel. Richard Gloss was used to running a motel. It had, like I said, a lot of unsavory characters. And when the police come around, you don't always tell them everything you know. Richard Glossop had been told earlier that morning by Justin Sneed that he had just killed Barry Van Trees. Richard said he kind of blew it off. He said, ah, you had to know Justin. You just had to know him. Once the police saw that Richard was not necessarily telling them the whole truth. 
they began to focus in on Richard. It took a week, it took a week to arrest Justin Sneed. When initially asked by the police at the station, what do you know about this? His answer was, I don't know anything. I don't know anything. Did you kill him? No, I didn't kill him. Right off the bat, we know that Justin Sneed is capable of lying to try to help himself. In the videotape of his police interview, you can watch Sneed go from denial to confession under interrogation. But remember, the police also have Richard Glossop in custody, so they want to prove he was involved too. We think uh, we know that this involves more than just you, okay? I personally don't think you're the only one. If you just said you don't want to talk to us, you want to talk to an attorney, and we'd, take, we'd march you down to the jail, and we'd book you in for this charge, and you'd be facing this thing on your own. And I just don't think you should take the whole thing. Rich is trying to save himself by saying you're in this by yourself. This wasn't a good cop, bad cop routine. Both detectives gently cajoled him into confessing. According to Rich, you told him that you killed the man. And what we want you to do is try to do the manly thing here and get this thing straightened out. We want to hear your side of it. We're not bad people. We're not trying to bully you or pressure you. But we're telling you, this is not going to get it. You're going to have to get straight with us. You're going to have to get straight with yourself. Me, you have to get straight with the Almighty. After 20 minutes of this, Sneed owns up. Is it all your idea, the whole thing? No, sir. Well, okay, tell me. You need to tell us about it. Sneed then tells the cops it was Richard's idea to rob Van Treese and split the money. Sadly, the audio was too muffled to use much of it. Rich asked you to kill Barry? Yes. Yeah. So he could run the motel without him being blocked. If you didn't catch that, Sneed says, yes, Richard asked him to kill Barry so he could run the motel as the boss. His attorneys say that's not a credible motive for murder. Even if Richard feared Barry was about to fire him, as was claimed at trial, how would killing him make Richard the boss? The Van Treese family would still own the motel. Nevertheless, the teenager pleaded guilty to murder and testified against Richard to get a reduced sentence of life in prison. I asked Graham Wetton to take a look at the interrogation video. Graham is a retired Scotland Yard police officer who regularly comments on policing matters for us at Sky News. Even though he's no longer a serving officer, he still trains cops in how to interview suspects. By chance, Richard phoned me from prison just as Graham finished watching the video, so Richard was able to hear his assessment at the same time I was. It seemed very uh, blinkered. Um, it seemed they already made their mind up. Graham, is that a way that you would see British police officers conducting an interview in a similar circumstance? No, absolutely not. Completely not. There's a model for police officers to interview suspects in, in the UK. Um, having watched the interview and listened to it, uh, it just seemed that they, they never ever gave him, the, uh, they never clarified anything with him. They just listened to what he said. They were almost suggesting things to him during the interview, never challenged anything. They've made you the scapegoat in this. There was almost an incentive yeah, for him. Fine. Um, to start speaking or you're going to be locked up. If you don't tell us effectively what we want to hear from you, uh, you're going to be a scapegoat and you're going to be locked up for this. I agree 100%. And I appreciate you looking at that and seeing it. And I hope that you know, we can get this out to a lot of people because I think they need to know that you know, what happened that day. Because see, one of the things that hurt me really bad is the jury was never allowed to see that video. Anybody that watches it, anybody that listens to the just the dialogue between the officers and, and him w would work out effectively. They almost made their minds up before they went into the interview. I've just found it an astonishing interview to watch and, and reading what's happened with the case, I just find it amazing that they, they, you're, you're where you are now based on that sort of interview and that sort of testimony. I, I, can't, I can't imagine a police officer in the UK, if it was here, would go through that, the same sort of interview and conduct it in the same way. You know, Rick is under arrest, don't you? Well, I didn't know that. Yeah, he's under arrest too. Okay. So he's the one, he's putting it on you the worst. I think if that interview was shown to a, to a British court, to a British judge and a jury, it would first will be ruled inadmissible. I think it would be a long legal argument about the admissibility of the interview based on the fact that the, the two detectives conducting it would be viewed to be being oppressive just by where they're sitting, where they've got their suspects sitting down and their manner of questioning. We know British policing and justice are different from that in America, 
But even so, Richard felt vindicated to hear an ex-cop telling him he'd been a victim of a miscarriage of justice. Phil Cross, who interviewed him in prison, points out there is no forensic evidence linking Richard Glossop to the murder. Barry Ventry's put up a hell of a fight and struggled for his death. And it wasn't a split-second decision that Justin Steed made to pull a trigger on somebody. It was a calculated and cold and brutal murder. And there he's sitting, sitting pretty for the rest of his life, still in jail, obviously. But you've got the, the other guy that's, that's going to the death chamber. Richard Glossop is undoubtedly guilty of being an accessory to murder. Accessory after the fact, for sure. I mean, that's a crime that's punishable by prison time. Uh, it's not a death penalty crime in Oklahoma. Reporters like me who are interested in the case wish we could turn back the clock and attend his trial to try to figure out why a jury preferred to believe Sneed over Glossop. The trials didn't get a lot of press attention at the time. I've tried to talk to the attorneys who prosecuted the case, but none of them would talk to me. So I went to see another lawyer called Ed Blau. I was an assistant district attorney in the county where Richard Glossop was prosecuted. I'm actually friends with the, the two lead senior prosecutors on the case. Um, I never worked on it directly. However, I was in the office when it was being prosecuted, so I, I'm familiar with the facts. I also know the defense attorneys involved. How strong do you think the evidence is in this case? Let me say this. Two different juries in Oklahoma County have heard the evidence, and both of them found him guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. The reason why this case is getting so much scrutiny is because it is a death penalty case. People are convicted of murder and, and other crimes all the time based on accomplice testimony, based on circumstantial evidence. I mean, that's what the law is in the United States. However, when you're giving somebody the ultimate punishment, we become accustomed to there being more, there being a confession, there being videotape evidence, there being a mountain of evidence. And in this particular case, if you're looking at it through the lens of the death penalty, the evidence does not seem to be substantial enough uh, to warrant that. And I believe that's why um, it's getting the scrutiny it is. Do you think it's a, a weaker death penalty case than others that you've come across? Um, this case is unique, um, at least in the past decade, to say that, that the evidence is weak or to say that, um, that the jury shouldn't have convicted. Um, I wasn't in there for the whole trial. I didn't hear every bit of the evidence. I didn't see the witnesses. However, um, you know, when something's based on co-conspirator testimony and based on circumstantial evidence, when capital punishment is, is being sought, most people think it should be more than that. In the past week, Richard's attorney, Don Knight, has put together what he describes as eight different versions of what Justin Sneed says really happened. Knight has picked apart how Sneed has changed facts and details between his police interview and his testimony in court. The motive has gone from robbery to a plot by Glossop to take over the motel with the owner dead. The amount of money Sneed says he was promised for the murder kept changing significantly. Later versions of his story included details on how he said they planned to dispose of the body using acid and a hacksaw. But the truth is, Barry Van Trees lay where he was murdered for 18 hours with no attempt to get rid of the evidence. If there was a plot, it wasn't a very good one. Last October, Richard Glossop had a clemency hearing, his last chance to argue why he shouldn't be executed. Attorneys presented their arguments... Richard appeared via a video link from prison to restate his plea of innocence. Barry Van Treese's brother, Kenneth, testified too. According to a newspaper reporter, he choked back tears as he told the parole board, if anybody ever deserved to be executed, Richard Glossop deserves it. Clemency was rejected. But what the panel didn't hear was a letter, apparently sent by Justin Sneed's daughter, Justine. It arrived too late to be considered though we will never know if it would have made a difference. I've asked a colleague to read a part of it. For a couple of years now, my father's been talking to me about recanting his original testimony, but has been afraid to act upon it in fear of being charged with the death penalty. His fear of recanting, but guilt about not doing so, makes it obvious that information he's sitting on would exonerate Mr. Glossop. I'm sure if he felt safe that he would not lose his plea agreement, he would give new and truthful testimony, much different than his testimony 17 years ago. He's asked me several times to look into what the legal ramifications would be to his own case if he recanted. He was backed into a corner, facing being charged with the death penalty, but was offered a plea agreement of life without parole to testify against Mr. Glossop. 
I feel he is holding important facts about Mr. Glossop's case in fear of losing his own deal. I am sure that Mr. Glossop did not do what my father originally said, that he did not hire my father to kill Mr. Van Trees, and he doesn't deserve to die over my father's actions. Those words offer Richard his best chance of a reprieve, but, and it's a big but, his attorney, Don Knight, has been unable to find her to get her to swear an affidavit. We have made extensive efforts to find Justine Sneed. A lot of efforts. A lot of our time has been spent because she said she has a letter or letters from her father that state that he was feeling bad about the stories that he told and he really wanted to come forward. We haven't been able to find her. If she's out there, if she hears any of this, please contact us. And although Justin Sneed has refused to talk to reporters, last December he did send a rambling letter to an Oklahoma journalist. In it he said his daughter didn't know much about his case, but the detectives had lied to him. They told me they could help me if I told the truth, only to tell me after I did that it was up to someone else and they were going to give me death. So I ask you what the purpose of truth really is, if it forces me to help kill someone else. Of course, in the end, prosecutors did allow him to escape a death sentence. And in the letter, he still insists Richard is guilty. In my heart, it wasn't all about the money he was offering. After all, he took half after he told me to get it from Van Treese's car. I made the choice to obey an order out of loyalty to him. So there appears to be no chance of Sneed recanting his evidence. But given what his daughter wrote, aren't you as confused as I am about Justin Sneed's story and his motivation? And if the evidence is relatively weak, why did the jurors convict? Would a jury in another country, even another American state, have reached the same conclusion? Here's Ed Blau again. Oklahoma as a state is very conservative. It's religiously conservative and it's politically conservative. And that same conservatism lends itself to issues like capital punishment. Um, supporters of the death penalty here in Oklahoma, which is a vast majority of the state, they look to the Bible, they look to the Old Testament, and follow it. Um, I also believe that um, it is a little bit of a, a Wild West mentality. A lot of Oklahomans see themselves as, you know, kind of frontiersmen. You know, if you look at, at the at gun ownership, it's extremely high. And that hang em high Old West justice mentality carries on to this day. And not only that, but your chances of getting a sympathetic jury aren't great. Whenever you have a jury trial where the death penalty is sought, the jurors that sit on that jury have to be what's called death qualified. That means they have to be able to impose the death penalty if they feel the evidence warrants it. What that means in practice is that the people who would more likely be liberal or defense oriented, they are automatically excluded from the jury panel because if somebody is 100% opposed to the death penalty, they're not allowed to sit on that jury. By its very nature, the panel of jurors are going to be more conservative and more likely to convict than a jury in a robbery case or any other type of case. Did Richard Glossop get a fair trial? Is he guilty? As a journalist, I've always tried to avoid giving my opinion. It shouldn't be about what I think. I just present the details and let you be the judge. But you'll have realized that these podcasts tell Richard Glossop's story from my perspective. So here's my conclusion. Even if you're in favour of the death penalty, shouldn't it be reserved for those who aren't just guilty beyond reasonable doubt, but beyond any doubt? If the state is going to kill someone, you'd want to be absolutely sure, wouldn't you? Next time I'll tell you about visiting Richard in prison. With only days left. The clock is ticking. And how our interview with the Hollywood actress caused an explosion of interest in his case. For an urgent Dr. Phil exclusive.